it's clear that social relationships are actually critical um, for, for good mental well-being and um, for our positive mental health. It's, it's actually good for us not to be alone. We're not meant to be alone. We're meant to connect with other human beings. And there are literally hundreds of verses in the Bible um, about relationships and friendships because we're created to be together in a community and have connections with each other. Because actually relationships aren't always easy to navigate, are they? Relationships can be some of the hardest things and yet some of the most beneficial things in our lives. You know, people can be some of the best things in our lives and some of the worst things in our lives, if we're honest, can't they? Um, but we have a longing to feel connected to each other. It's innate within us. Well, good morning, everybody. I'm still trying to work out why avocados are like jaguars, but um, as everyone else has started with a fun fact this morning, I feel that perhaps I need to. So I read this morning that uh, a little girl was asked, what's the difference between Father's Day and Mother's Day? And she said, well, they're exactly the same, but you spend a lot more on Mother's Day. <laughs> <laughs> Right. So thank you to Carla for making my PowerPoints readable. I brought a very small PowerPoint in this morning. and She's done her magic, so thank you. So we've been looking at... Um, Jamie's been going through a series on Acts. Well, I'm going to interrupt that today and bring you a continuation of our occasional series on um, well-being. And you might remember that this started last November when Nick did an overview of the five ways to well-being. Um, and if you've looked at the Haven Facebook page, you will see that this is actually our, um, whatever you call it, on the, on the Facebook page, not the picture, the sort of the panel, because it's so important to the whole project and the whole, um, the whole ethos of the project. Um, it's centred around well-being. And just to remind you that the five ways to well-being have actually come out of research and they're something that have been adopted within um, the NHS and are well known within the, the mental health um, sphere of, of an understanding that these five ways are ways that can actually promote good well-being with us. So I'm going to carry that series on today and I'm going to talk about Connect um, so research provides strong evidence that feeling close to and valued by other people is actually fundamental, a human need, and it's one that contributes to functioning well in the world. I'm going to have to take this out because it keeps falling down. Um, so tripping over this thing. So just give me a minute while I sort myself out. <laughs> Okay, so it's, it's clear that social relationships are actually critical um, for, for good mental well-being and um, for our positive mental health. You know, and we shouldn't actually be surprised at this because relationships are a theme that runs constantly through the Bible. Um, when God created Adam, the first thing he said to him was, it's not good for man to be alone, and he created Eve might not be something that every man agrees with, but, you know, there you go. It's, it's actually good for us not to be alone. We're not meant to be alone. We're meant to connect with other human beings. And there are literally hundreds of verses in the Bible um, about relationships and friendships because we're created to be together in a community and have connections with each other. And the phrase one another is mentioned over a hundred times in the New Testament. Um, and I've just got an example here of uh, some, of the some of the one another's that occur in the New Testament. Love one another, and this command is at least 16 times. Um, other ones are build one another up, greet one another, bear one another's burdens, forgive one another. Um, so, well, there's some more. Well, next slide, yeah. Be patient with one another. Be kind and compassionate to one another. Teach one another. Comfort one another. 
Stir up one another to love and good works and show hospitality to one another. So approximately 59, I haven't counted them by the way, I've, I've read this. Approximately 59 of those occurrences of one another are specific commands teaching us how to and how not to relate to each other. Because actually relationships aren't always easy to navigate, are they? Relationships can be some of the hardest things and yet some of the most beneficial things in our lives. You know, people can be some of the best things in our lives and some of the worst things in our lives, if we're honest, can't they? Um, But we have a longing to feel connected to each other. It's innate within us. Um, And that's why solitary confinement is considered the strongest form of punishment because to be alone for can be days, weeks, months, years on end is actually one of the strongest forms of punishment because we're not made to be on our own in solitary. We're made to be with other people. So it's the first condition of being human. And there's a, a, a quote I like by somebody called Petrusha, Petruska Clarkson. And she says, relationship is the first condition of being human. It circumscribes two or more individuals and creates a bond in the sphere in between them that is more than some of their parts. So in other words, we're better together. You know, if we've got other people around us and we're connected, we're better than when we're on our own. When people go through tough times we can be a comfort to them. And when we go through tough times, we're better if we have people around us, if we have the right people around us. So we've just come through a pandemic, um, and many of us have had to be isolated, be disconnected from people. Um, And it's been a tough time, actually, if we're honest, hasn't it, for for most of us in in one form or another. But one of the actual advantages of technology during that time was that it enabled us to connect with each other. Um, I have a sister-in-law that lives in Australia, and I'm actually able to get on a computer and see her. Uh, We spoke to her yesterday, and she took us on a walk around where she lived, Um, And we can see all those things that we'd never, ever have been able to do if we didn't have technology. So technology helps us to stay connected with each other. But like most things, what's good can also be really bad. And maybe this is why. You know, how many times do you see people sat together on their phones instead of talking to each other? Or in a restaurant, um, out together for a meal, and yet everyone is on their phone instead of connecting and talking to each other. So research um, suggests that a lot more people feel lonely after the pandemic. In 2018, Theresa May said that loneliness is one of the greatest public health challenges of our time. And she actually appointed a minister of loneliness in recognition of the damage that loneliness was doing to people. And yet more people now in 2022 feel lonely than they did in 2018. So something's not working, something's broken. Um, something needs to be restored. One of the ways that hurting people are restored is through unconditional acceptance and unconditional love. And for those of us who know God, it's his unconditional love and acceptance that are restoring the brokenness within our own lives are actually changing us and taking us on a journey of wholeness and restoration. And it's us, as Jesus' representatives on this earth, I have Jesus living in me. If you know Jesus, you have Jesus living in you. So it's you and me that can take Jesus' love 
and unconditional acceptance into the world and bring wholeness and restoration. So first and foremost, we're made to be in relationship with God. We need to connect with God, we need to spend time with him, and we need to find the way that we do that in the best way that we can. So for some of us, we might be able to spend a long time in prayer with God. For others of us, my, my best times with God are walking along the seafront. And for some of you, you'll have different places and different ways of connecting with God. And it's really important we do that. Um, but actually, our connections with other people are an outworking of our relationship and our connection with God. So we need to be mindful of how we are and how we react with people and, and the interactions that take place. So it's that unconditional love and acceptance that we can bring to other people that will show them Jesus living in me um, and bring them to restoration. But I just want to take a moment to say what unconditional love isn't because it's not accepting hurtful and toxic behaviours. If you're in a relationship that is emotionally or physically abusive, unconditional love is not continuing in that relationship. You can, you can still have a love and acceptance for that person, but you don't have to be in that relationship. It's not the time to unpack this. That could be a whole other sermon. But sometimes we have a misconception of what unconditional love and acceptance is. Loving someone unconditionally is not excusing their behavior or accepting abuse. And Jesus modeled healthy boundaries when he was on the earth, and we need to model healthy boundaries in our own relationships. So Jesus didn't accept those who were trying to abuse him. He didn't give in to those who tried to manipulate him and to those who had the wrong agenda for him. And neither do we. We need to model unconditional love and acceptance in the way that Jesus modelled unconditional love and acceptance. So as well as giving out, I also need people in my own life who are going to give me unconditional love and unconditional acceptance. And for me... I am naturally Mrs. Independent. I want to do everything on my own. Um, Ian will tell you that. <laughs> you know, he knows me best, he lives with me. And I have, over the years, had to, to change the way I think, to change the way I do life, to change the way I feel. Because one of the ways that God has worked in me is to help me to accept help from other people. It's not easy, is it, <coughs> for some of us? I was brought up to think that I needed to manage on my own. I was brought up to think that it was weak to ask for help. But, you know, Jesus didn't model on this earth a life of independence. One of the things he did was that he sought the joys of friendship. He sought the joys of companions to travel alongside him. He shared meals with people. He shared his life with people. When he faced sorrow and fear, he sought the comfort of his friends. He didn't do it on his life, all on his own. And right at the end, when he was physically too weak to carry his own cross, somebody else carried it for him. And that's what we need to do sometimes. We need to allow other people to carry our crosses with us. So Jesus says that we will be known as a church and individually by how we love one another. John 13, 34, 35. A new commandment I give you, love one another as I have loved you. So you also must love one another. By this, everyone know, will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. So how do people know that we follow God? Because we love one another. 
but we can't relate to everyone on the same level and the same sphere. And we will have different levels of relationships, contacts in our lives. And I just want to look at some of those in the context of how Jesus related to people when he was on the earth. So the first level of relationship that we have will be those that we connect with through maybe circumstances or casual relationships. Perhaps those people that we pass on a walk or we meet at the school gate the checkout person at the supermarket, someone that we have brief exchanges with. And Jesus had those relationships too. But he was prepared to feed 5,000 people. And I'm guessing he didn't have intimate relationships with those 5,000. Possibly saw them once and never saw them again. He also worked through single moments in a person's life. He once met a Samaritan woman at a well, someone he didn't have an ongoing relationship with. And this woman wasn't even given a name in the Bible. And she represented the lowest of the low. A female in a society where women were, were shamed and outcast. She was, um, women were disregarded. She was a Samaritan woman, so she was despised by the Jews And she lived in shame and was a social outcast. And yet Jesus took time to be with her. And those few moments changed her life. And not only did they change her life, she went back into the village and gave testimony. And they changed the lives of other people too. And it's the same for us. That small smile that we offer someone as we're walking past them that five minutes that we take to talk to someone can actually change someone's lives. How many times have you been feeling down and somebody smiled at you and it's lifted your spirit? When Joel was in primary school, there was a, a th- uh, one of those posters on the wall and it said, if you see someone without a smile, give them one of yours. And that's something that stuck with me and... You know, I try and smile at people, I try and interact with people, I, and I've ne- I never used to be like that. When I was like 18, 19, I suffered from social anxiety, I'd run away from people. Um, so it's something that I've had to work at. Um, you know, I would, I would go to things at, at work, conferences, training things, and I would feel sick because I really didn't like being with people and I had all those things. So... For those of you that don't find it easy, I know. I know what it's like. Um, But God's work through me, and I do know it's God working through me that's changed me in a way that I can now bless others, or I hope I can bless others, um, by doing some of these things. So we can make a difference to people, sometimes without even knowing it. And then the next sphere is those that we have a bit of a closer relationship with. And for Jesus, these were the 70. They shared a common goal with him. Um, And we know this because he eventually sent them out in his name to do his work. And these will be people that we have not an intimate relationship with, but perhaps we we play on the same football team. Not me, obviously. Um, But, you know, or, or the mums we meet at the school gate or people that we work with. So we have a bit of a deeper interaction with. Um, and, and we still have those opportunities to input into people's lives, but not in a deep way. Because, of course, the group that we most think about when we um, think of Jesus' friendship are so the disciples, um, his 12 disciples. For three years, they lived together and worked together, sharing intimacy, ministry, and companionship. So for this, there will be a smaller circle of people. Might be some of the people we work with. Might be some of the people in this church. um, Might be people that we share a common interest with. And we do a bit more of life together. And one of the most interesting things I find about the 12 disciples is how different they were. 
And I haven't got time to, to talk about how they were all seen, but I just want to pick out a few. Because Peter, who is actually my favourite character in the New Testament, was a hot-tempered individual, wasn't he? Someone who was impetuous, somebody who jumped in without thinking, um, and possibly somebody that if, if you knew from afar, you might not want on your team. And then there was James and John, who were known as Sons of Thunder. Now, Son of Thunder probably means they were a bit hot-tempered too um, and had a bit of a reputation. So I'm thinking, right, that's three out of 12. That's 25% of your team that actually could be loose cannons, um, you know, that you might not be able to control, that would be doing all these things. And yet Jesus chose them. And then he chose Matthew, who was a tax collector. And at the time, most tax collectors were dishonest. Um, and people didn't like them. And so Jesus chose him to be on his team. And there was this guy called Bartholomew, who was known as an honest man. Now, I wonder how Bartholomew felt felt when Jesus invited a tax collector. So you've got an honest person and a dishonest person working alongside each other. I don't know about you, I'm, I'm generally like the sensible one in the team. So, <laughs> you know, the thought of working with all these people, it's not easy, is it? And yet, they did life together. And I wonder, actually, whether it was because of those people that Jesus were walking alongside so closely that he taught all these ways that we should relate to one another. I wonder whether some of those actually came out of his lived experience with his team. Look, guys, just get on and love each other. Just build each other up. Um, just do what's best for each other. So naturally, we might want to gravitate towards the people who think and act like us. But if we want to grow, we need to be, people who are diff be with people who are different to us, who are going to see different perspectives. And there's a slide here of an elephant. Um, and if you look at the elephant, you'll see that each person is just feeling a bit of the elephant and one person's feeling its tail and thinking it's a rope. One person's feeling the, the skin and thinking it's a wall. One person's feeling the trunk and thinking it's a tree. One's the ears flapping so side and they think it might be a fan. Um, and one's got the tusk and they think it's a spear. So individually, if we look at just different things, we don't get to see the whole picture, do we? We can stand back and we can see that's an elephant. But those individual people just looking at their tiny bit can only see the bit they're looking at. And that's why we need people who are different to us to walk alongside us. Because that's how we're going to grow. And then I've just got two more slides that look at different perspectives of things. So you might have seen this picture before. And you've got one person saying there's four trunks and one person saying there's three. And it just depends which way you, you look at it. And they might both be right. Um, and sometimes we look at things from different angles and can see different things. And then the next slide, we've got somebody looking at a six from one side, but you look at it from the other side and it's a nine. So again, it depends what perspective you look at things, but you need other people and you need people around you to see the whole perspective. And I particularly like this quote from Einstein, which says, we cannot solve our problems with the same thinking we used when we created them. And so often we try and do that, don't we? We get stuck in a cycle. We create problems and we think that thinking is going to get us out of those problems. But actually, we need other people to come alongside us and give us a different perspective and help us get out of the difficulty that we've got into. 
And then from the 12, Jesus developed his closest relationship with just three people, Peter, James, and John. So it's going to be the same for us. We're going to have people in all those different spheres that we interact with. And each of these connections will assume different expectations. We'll need to give different time and energy to them. We'll have a handful of friends who walk the closest with us and know the most about us. These will be the people that we can be vulnerable with, whom we have a deeper understanding and, and, and able to trust them more, to process and to handle, and probably the first people that we turn to in a time of crisis. So it's really important that we don't get upset or take our worth from someone else's inner circle. It's easy, isn't it, to look at a close set of friends and think, oh, I wish I could be part of that circle. There's something wrong with me because I'm not in that circle, in that clique. And it's easy to feel rejected. But we can't be best friends with everyone. We don't have the capacity. Most of us won't have 5,000 in our outer circle, and most of us will have less than five in our inner circle. So we need to concentrate on developing those relationships where we have got key relationships and not waste time worrying about other people's friendships and other people's relationships because our worth will be in the people who accept us and love us. So we need to bring out the best in our friends and they need to bring out the best in us. To have great friends, I need to be a great friend. It's got to start with me. But it's usually it's those inner circles that we can have the best and the worst relationships. We have the hardest relationships because they know the most about us. We'll be most vulnerable to them. We're opening up to them and we're exposing ourselves to them. And those relationships can actually be quite hard to navigate. So we do need to intentionally seek friends who will build us up, not friends who are going to drag us down. We need to create positive, healthy relationships. And we need to ask ourselves whether those people who are closest to us are influencing us, influencing us for good and God. And we need to ask ourselves, are we influencing those people closest to us for good and God? And I just want to take a, a quick look at a relationship um, between Jesus and Peter. Because Jesus and Peter modelled how to navigate some of those difficult times and, and it's an example of how things can go wrong in a relationship. So um, Jesus is in the Garden of Gethsemane. Uh, the Roman soldiers have come. They're going to take him away. Um, and it says, Then Simon Peter, who had a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's servant, cutting off his right ear. But Jesus answered no more of this, and he touched the man's ear and healed him. And I just wonder what was going on for both of them at that time and for the other disciples looking on. I wonder whether Peter was, you know, people were looking at Peter and thinking, oh, Peter, haven't you learned? You know, can you just put your sword back in your pocket and stop being that hot-headed person? I wonder what Jesus felt. I wonder if there was a fleeting moment when he thought, Jesus, it's Peter, didn't you listen when I said, love your enemy? Why do you need to cut him off with a sword? But I've got compassion for you, Peter. I'm actually going to put that ear back on that, that soldier. Because otherwise I know that you're going to end up in a lot of trouble. But I wonder what Peter felt. I wonder if he felt disappointed in Jesus. That Jesus didn't stand up for him in this moment. I wonder if he felt let down. Jesus, don't you know what I'm doing for you? 
Don't you know that I don't want them to take you away? I'm just standing up for you. Why on earth would you heal him? Don't you care about me, Jesus? And I wonder if it was that disappointment from Peter that caused him to deny Jesus three times. Because the next thing we know is that the Jesus was in a courtyard. Um, I'm not actually going to read that because I'm running out of time. But um, Peter was in a, a courtyard and three people asked him if he knew Jesus. And each time Peter said no. And I wonder if that's because Peter was hurt and disappointed because he felt that actually he'd stood up for Jesus and Jesus wasn't standing up for him. So therefore, I'm going to take it. And I'm just going to say I don't know this person because that's how we are, isn't it? That's how we react. You know, someone hurts me, I'm going to hurt them. Someone hurts me, I'm going to get angry or disappointed. But then Peter realized what he'd done because the cock crowed. And he wept and he left. And I'm guessing for Peter that that must have been tragic because as far as he knew, Jesus was going off to die and he would never see him again. So I'm wondering how he felt then. But actually, Peter and Jesus also modeled reconciliation. So if we just have the last verses up. Jesus appears to the disciples on the Sea of Galilee. And it says, Then the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, and I wonder if that irked Peter, actually, because John's always known as the disciple that, Peter, that Jesus loved. I wonder if that irked him. But it is the Lord. As soon as Simon Peter heard him say, It is the Lord, he wrapped his outer garment around him, for he'd taken it off, and jumped into the water. So there was no hesitancy. There was an urgency. Peter couldn't wait for the boat to get back. He wanted to reconcile with Jesus straight away at the earliest opportunity. And Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish you have just caught. So Simon Peter climbed back into the boat and dragged the net ashore. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. So Jesus was reconciling to Peter over a meal, over breakfast. Come and break bread together. Let's pick up where we left off. Let's forget about the stuff. Let's just, he did go on, as you know, to sort of sort it out because, you know, it's important that we don't just brush these things up under the carpet. We do um, address these issues in our, our relationships because that's how we grow and how we move on. But the point is, they both wanted to get over the blip in their relationship and to reconcile. So I just want to conclude by saying that relationships are difficult. Um, so if you have a relationship with anyone, if you go into marriage expecting it to be a bed of roses you know, then those of us that have been married 37 years will be able to tell you it's not. Um, It's got its ups and downs. But the thing is, you get through it, don't you? And you work things out. And it's the same with other friendships. Um, You know, you have to work at those relationships. And you do it because you're modeling Jesus and because of the benefit it gives you. So at some point... I will be disappointed. I will feel let down with my friend. But I too am human, so I will disappoint them and let them down too. So I need to be aware of those things and I need to model reconciliation where I need to. Because navigating the disappointment and the bumps along the road is how we grow, how we mature, And it's part of the process of our being transformed into Christ. So I'm going to invite the band up just to to finish. And I'm just going to finish with a prayer as they come up. Father, I want to thank you that we're made to be in relationship. I thank you for the people around me. um, And I just pray that you would help us all to get the connections that we need And those connections that have you in the middle of them, the ones that are so valuable, I pray you'd speak to us 
um, where we need to change in our relationships um, and that you would just help us to continue to grow and to become like you through other people. In Jesus' name, amen.